Hello again. Welcome to another edition of Prophecy Watchers. I'm Gary Stearman, and once again, my guest is author and lecturer Bill Solis. Hi, Bill. Hi, Gary. It's good to be back again. Hey, always good to talk to you, Bill. And by the way, you're going to find out why it's good to talk to Bill, because he's got some really interesting information prophetically speaking. As a matter of fact, we're going to be talking about this book, Nuclear Showdown in Iran, in Iran, and by, there's an accompanying DVD, which we'll mention later. Uh, essentially, Bill has taken a prophecy that was kind of a little-known prophecy up until very recently in, in Jeremiah 49, and I'm going to start in verse 34, Bill, and just kind of bring okay. people up to speed. Sure. Jeremiah writes, uh, it's, it's almost a strange prophecy if you've never encountered it before. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the chief of their might. And I'll stop right there. And first of all, let's identify Elam, but also... I want to mention the fact that when you see a prophecy in the Bible that is this uh, overt, discreet, then you want to look for it either having been fulfilled at some time in the past or uh, thinking that it might be fulfilled at some time in the future. So I'm sure you've been through all those exercises. Yes, absolutely. And my conclusion is that it has not found historical fulfillment. I do go through the reasons for that inside of the book, mm -hmm. and at I've drawn the conclusion that we are looking at a prophecy for our time that is imminent, and as we explore the details of the prophecy, we're going to see that the conditions are ripe right now for this prophecy. Now, a lot of you may have read this prophecy over the years, <coughs> and you may have, uh, have read about Elam, E-L-A-M, I think most people probably in the past pronounce, pronounce it Elam. It, I'm not sure that's it's important, except have you ever wondered who Elam is or Elam? Uh, and, and by the way, who are they? They're sort of mysterious. Right. Now, Elam was the grandson of Noah. He was the son of Shem. And his descendants made their way down and sort of settled in the area of modern-day Iran that hugs the Persian Gulf. Mm -hmm. So it would be on the western side of Iran. Mm. Now, when we look at a map of modern-day Iran, you'll see Elam comprises about one-fifth of modern-day Iran, and Persia makes, ancient Persia makes up the rest. Mm -hmm. So the other four-fifths. Now, Jeremiah writes a prophecy of the latter days in, about Elam. He, you read verse 34, says it was during the early reign of King Zedekiah. King Zedekiah was the last king of Judah. Mm -hmm. And so we would put the timing of this prophecy around 596 B.C. Now, Jeremiah's contemporary Ezekiel, he wrote around 593 to 582 B.C. And he wrote about Persia in that window period of time. And his Ezekiel 38 prophecy, many of your viewers may be very familiar with that Gog of Magog prophecy, very powerful prophecy. But he, Ezekiel also uses the same words in the latter, latter years, mm -hmm. latter days rather. So we have two latter days prophecies written nearly about the same time, but dealing with Iran. But I point out in the book they're distinctly different prophecies. So uh, when we come to ask about what's going on with Iran's nuclear program, what's the future of Iran going to be like, um, there's plenty of things on the news channel with the, the geopolitical narrative or the you know, to try to give you a look at what could happen mm -hmm. from historical ideas or whatever, military ideas. But we're going to give the viewers the biblical perspective of this scenario that's going on right now. You know, when we, uh, on another, another program, we, we spoke of a, a group of people in Psalm 83 who were called Edom. And you might call them Edomites. And so the, uh, you, you go through an analysis process in, in your mind well, who are the Edomites? And you have to sort of try to identify them. Well, I would ask the same question about Elam. Uh, who are the Elamites? That is to say, can we identify them today? Can we trace them back? What are they known for? Uh, uh, did they have historical uh, weight of any kind? Uh, yes, there, there's quite a bit of references to them, even in the Bible. Uh, they go back as far as Genesis 14, I mean, they go back to you know the book of Genesis, the descendants of Noah and stuff. Mm -hmm. But in Genesis 14, 
you have this episode where Abraham's nephew Lot gets kidnapped. And this is when these four kings come against five kings in a confrontation. Now, one of those kings was King Chedorlaomer of Elam. Mm -hmm. So we find out uh -huh. about 4,000 years ago that the Elamites were war like people. I call them war mongers. Mm -hmm. okay? We jump the clock ahead to Isaiah's time, who prophesied between 740 to 701 B.C. And we find out in Isaiah 22.6 that they were expert archers. So they had roughly about 1,300 years from the time of Abraham to the time of Isaiah to perfect their war skills. And their, me their weapon of preferred choice, of course, was the bow, which is interesting when Jeremiah says, I will break the bow yes. of Elam as part of the judgment that comes upon Elam. Hmm. Breaking the bow of Elam. Now, of course, we're talking about uh, an era in the 21st century, and we've gone on beyond bows and arrows. Or have we? <laughs> maybe, maybe those arrows could be something else right now. Right. Well, if it is a prophecy for our time, again, yeah. I do sincerely believe that it is a prophecy for our time. Uh, we're probably talking about the concerns of missile launching. So, for instance, um, you know, an a, a, a archer, when his bow is broken, he could have a quiver full of atomic arrows, if you will, or arrows or something, mm -hmm. but he's not going to be able to launch them at their intended target. And so when you look at what's going on geopolitically right now in current events with Benjamin Netanyahu, Prime Minister of Israel, who's very concerned about Iran's nuclear program. Yes. He's been talking about a parallel concern. Not only the uh, enrichment of uranium and the, the centrifuges, he wants that pro program dismantled. Presently, Iran has 19,000 centrifuges, which if they were spinning 24-7, estimates are they could have a nuclear weapon in as short a time as mm -hmm. four to six weeks. Ayatollah Khomeini says he wants to have 190,000 which estimates are if they ever got to that stage, they could produce 38 atomic weapons per year. But he's also talking about we've got to stop Iran's ICBM development program, intercontinental ballistic missiles. And it, the only purpose you have an ICBM is to put a nuclear warhead on it mm -hmm. so that you can send it at far places. He is cautioning that a nuclear weapon could hit the east coast of America in 2015 at the rate of development of these ICBMs and the nuclear program in Iran. Iran is going to negotiate their way into a nuclear weapon. They continue to negotiate with the P5 plus one, the permanent five members of the United Nations Security Council, which would be Russia, China, Britain, France, the United States, and plus one being Germany. Mm -hmm. They've missed deadlines in July of 2014. They extended to November of 2014. And they are playing a game of chess. These are the makers of chess, the inventors of chess, these Iranians. And they are playing a game of chess and outsmarting the international community. And Benjamin Netanyahu has got his eye on what's going on. Yeah. Israel is fired up. And I'll tell you, I'm thinking there may be a strike coming here on Iran's nuclear program. Now, I want you all to notice the ease with which Bill went from ancient Elam, a warrior nation, back in the days of Abraham, really, coming up to today, same territory <clears throat> in this prophecy against Elam. Uh, and when the Lord says here, I will break the bow of Elam, and we know that this is a Latter-day prophecy simply be because we have studied it. You've studied it in great depth. You've established it's a Latter-day prophe uh, prophecy. And many people who are very, very <clears throat> uh, well-known as uh, as prophetic uh, students and lecturers have agreed with you on this point. In other words, you could always criticize Bill by saying, well, this has already been fulfilled 2,000 years ago or something. Uh, but it, that's not the case. <clears throat> this is yet to be fulfilled. And there are uh, many uh, students of eschatology who agree with Bill. I'll add just a couple of names that some of your viewers might be familiar with who take the entirely unfulfilled view. Uh, Bill Koenig, White House correspondent, prophecy teacher. Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum wrote The Footsteps of the Messiah. Joel Rosenberg. Uh, so there's just a few of them. Unfortunately, we can only name a few of them because the prophecy's been vastly overlooked. We're, we're revealing it now mm -hmm. so that this now can be uh, gathered by you, the viewers, as well as the biblical scholars in the, in the world. And only in the Bible can, can you read something with this kind of weight, something that extends into ancient history, comes right up to the present, which is what's exciting about Bible prophecy. Verse 36, And upon Elam <clears throat> will I bring the four winds 
from the four quarters of heaven and will scatter them toward all those winds and there shall be no nation whither the outcasts of Elam shall not come. That's, that is a big time scenario. That is, that's huge. Yeah, so the result of the judgment of the breaking of the bow at the foremost of the might. In other words, so we didn't emphasize that too. The foremost of Iran's might today, you would have to estimate was probably their nuclear program. Now, when we talk about the location of Elam, it is where the Bushar nuclear reactor is. That is their crown jewel. That's their trophy, first operational nuclear facility there. And I'm going to take a moment just to talk about that because it's going to make sense when we get into the verse you just read. Um, that nuclear facility was be, being built in the 70s by the Germans, but when the uh, Islamic Revolution in Iran occurred in 1979, the Germans got out of there. Iran tried to complete the project, but they needed the help of the Russians in 1995. Let me interrupt you just for a second now. We're talking about the Boucher nuclear reactor. It's on the coast of the Persian Gulf, right? Right down uh, where Iran meets the, the waters of the Persian Gulf. And, and again, this is the ancient land of Elam. Right. We have, to, we have to be geographically specific for this prophecy because it's not involving Persia, Right. the other part of Iran. It's involving this geographic area of, of by the Bashar, where the Bashar nuclear reactor is. What a, what a thing to do, build a, a nuclear reactor right on the edge of the Persian Gulf. I mean, it seems like foolish to me because if you've got an accident, you've polluted all the water. I well, mean. here's the, the grave concern with this is that it's built where three tectonic plates merge. Wow. In, and Iran is already 90% 90, 90 seismic as a country. And this is a 40-year-old facility with a 30-year-old cooling system, and no one trained in the facility to handle a nuclear disaster like Fukushima or Chernobyl. It is a nuclear disaster waiting to happen, and Russian fuel, nuclear fuel rods are loaded in this facility as of the summer of 2010. And when they were loaded, former UN Ambassador John Bolton said Israel's window period to strike that facility had closed because it would create a nuclear disaster. Now, I want to say another thing real quickly. It, uh, the Iran at this facility in April of 2013 <clears throat> had an earthquake of 6.8. It killed 37 people. And the Russian scientists came down under the auspices of just checking out the facility. But they pulled the Russian fuel rods out to check it if there's any kind of leakage or something going on. The week after that earthquake, there was a 7.7 .7 in Iran down by the border of Pakistan. And what this did was it prompted the Gulf states across the other side of the Persian Gulf, the point you bring up, what a dangerous location for this, to do a very exhaustive study about the dangers of the Bashar nuclear plant. And I don't want to jump to that conversation yet until we get to a future verse you're going to read. But the verse you just read is he's going to draw the four winds from the four quarters of heaven mm -hmm. against Elam and scatter them toward all those winds. This will be no nation where the outcasts of Elam don't go. Gary, that's a worldwide dispersion. It is. So it's, it's going to be, it sounds like a humanitarian crisis when the bow of Elam is broken at the foremost of its might. And we have a modern day example of refugees having to flee out of an area in Syria during that three to four year revolution that's been going on with Bashar Assad. But they have not fled throughout the world. They have gone, it's more localized dispersion in Turkey. Mm -hmm. You know, you get about three million Syrians displaced around Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, and Syria. We're not talking about that. So what would cause the dispersal of an indigenous population into all the nations of the world? <laughs> and my concern, and that's why it's called Nuclear Showdown, I think it's dealing with Iran's nuclear program. And that's, what, that's my concerns here. Hmm. And a legitimate concern, it seems to be. Uh, verse 37 now, let's, let's just move on. Uh, says this, For I will cause Elam to be dismayed, or upset, or frightened, or disturbed. Uh, I, I, the, you could translate that word a lot of ways, but Elam is going to be in a sad state. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies, and before them that seek their life. And I will bring evil upon them, even my fierce anger, saith the Lord, and I will send the sword after them till I have consumed them. Now, how do you add that set of facts into this prophecy? Well, this is really the meaty part of the prophecy right here. You find out that the Lord is fiercely angry. 
And of course, that's why the judgment is coming forward, and that's why the bow is going to be broken. He's angry because Iran, at the time of his anger, which I believe is right now, is going to launch something somewhere. You know, that's why he's going to break the bow and take that possibility out of the out of the situation. Let's stop right there. Do you get what Bill is saying? Breaking the bow. Now, this is an ancient idea brought into modern terms. An ancient bow and arrow is a modern ICBM. <clears throat> and to break the bow means to reduce or destroy the enemy's capability to launch those missiles, which, by the way, are, would, are zeroed in on, on Israel. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu has made this point time and time again before the United Nations. We read in the papers, we see on the internet, national, international news, America's the great Satan, Israel's the little Satan, we must destroy Israel. I mean, they're very clear. The Iranians are very clear about what they wish to do, and they have every intention of doing it, but this prophecy says they will not be able to do it. Absolutely, and so what we've got here is why is God angry? I'm going to explore that for just a moment. Okay. And who are the enemies, plural, that are referenced in that verse? Yeah. Uh, and the next verse, which you'll be reading in a moment, mm -hmm. verse 38, <coughs> it says that the Lord is going to destroy from there the kings and the princes. So in other words, God's angry because there's some bad leadership. Right. You don't destroy good leadership. They're going to be destroyed their bad leadership. And the leadership in Iran right now is very repressive. It's very it's it's really the most repressive Islamic regime on the planet right now and they're trying to put their hand on a nuclear weapon. Mm. So, but who are the enemies? And it says that they the enemies will uh, Iran will be dismayed before their enemies. And the Hebrew word for dismayed is it's going to be they'll be like in they'll be awestruck. It's it's and it says they'll bring a disaster upon Elam. We're talking about an epic biblical calamitous disaster that the enemies will see and they'll stand in awe. That's what is being said wow. there. And so now who are the enemies? Well, of course, God is angry. Israel is concerned about the nuclear program because they've been threatened of annihilation by Ayatollah Khomeini. He's called him a rabid dog, a cancerous tumor. The only solution to this fake Zionist regime, he calls it, is annihilation. He just issued a tweet that talked about the, uh, uh, the nine-point plan he has for the extermination of Israel. Mm -hmm. That was around November 8th or 9th like that. You can find that on the Internet. But well, who are the other enemies, plural? Well, this is where I want to talk about the GCC, the Gulf Cooperative Council, right on the other side of the Persian Gulf. Two-thirds of the world's desalinization plants are existing in those Arab Gulf states, and that would be Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, uh, Qatar, UAE, Bahrain, and Oman. And they are drinking water and potable water is a rare commodity over there. Mm -hmm. And so when they rely on that Persian Gulf, not only for the transports of their oil, which about 30% of the world's oil still comes oh. through there, about 50% of the world's oil reserves are still there, but also for their living and the sustenance of their populations. Mm -hmm. When this earthquake that I was talking about earlier happened at 6.8 at Bouchard, they conducted an exhaustive and expensive study. And their conclusions came out in July of 2013. And you'll be astounded when you hear what they're going to do. They said that in 15 hours, if there was an Israeli strike or an uh, earthquake at this facility, in 15 hours, nuclear radioactivity would come through the waters and through the, the skies, through the wind patterns that pushed that direction. And it would only affect 10% of the indigenous population of Iran because there's this big Zagros mountain range there that mm -hmm. will probably <clears throat> act as a barrier from it going on the other side into the ancient Persia area. Yeah. But it will come and affect 40 to 100% of the Arab populations there. Cancer, immediate death, you know, what, what happens with nu nuclear radioactivity. Sure. Yeah. And so what they decided to do, Gary, is they're going to build the world's longest pipeline. It's going to be 1,242 miles. It's going to go from inland, from Oman, all the way up through those uh, Arab states to Kuwait. It's going to cost $10.5 billion. It's going to be completed by 2020, not for oil, Gary, but for water, because they're concerned that Persian Gulf is going to be a disaster. Now, that is a disaster. And again, it's in this territory that's called Elam in this Latter-day Prophecy. So essentially, this is all pulling together into one very visible scenario. And let me just take a sidetrack here. We've, we've got a few minutes. How did you first see this? When did it hit you? And, it, and it, under what circumstances did you begin to see that this was going to happen? 
Well, when I was writing the Psalm 83 book <clears throat> that you're also offering here at, at uh, Prophecy Watchers, I was traveling in Jeremiah 49 quite a bit. Yeah. You know, there's there's 39 verses there, and I believe that the pretty much the first 27 verses have uh, importance when it comes to Psalm 83. And so I had read it many, many times, and I actually included in a prior book, I think it's in, actually in the Psalm 83 book, uh, just a chapter on Elam. I threw it out there as a prophecy for our time and said a few things about it, and I was pretty much content with that. Uh -huh. Some people had come along and read that. Bill Coney had started teaching on it at these conferences and stuff like that, and I was okay with that. But I was on a, a Praise the Lord TV and TV show with Jonathan Kahn, and sitting next to me was a guy named Reza Safa, who is an American Iranian who goes in through satellite television into Iran. Ooh. It's called Najat TV. And we were sitting live in front of a live audience. Minute, there's like 400 people in front of us. We're going to go live from about 2 million people, or how many millions with TBN's program. And Reza Safa holds this up, his iPad up to me and says, are you familiar with this prophecy? And he's pointing out Jeremiah 49, verses 34 through 39. And he says to me, did you know that Iranian Christians... Or, or there's, there's a huge harvest over there, the biggest harvest going on in the world right now, and they're looking to this prophecy as an opportunity to get out of Iran to preach the gospel to the nations of the world. Mm. And I looked down and I said, you know, Reza, I'm familiar with the prophecy. I wrote a little bit about it. I, I'm, I'm familiar with the Christian harvest going on over there, but this is not a good exit strategy. This is a disaster. This yeah. is not a picture of Ayatollah Kumbaya standing on the borders of Iran Handing out exit visas, okay, you're not happy with us, take this, yeah. take that. No, this is a disaster. And uh, next thing you know is roll camera action, and we were live, and that was the last time I had a chance to talk to Reza. So when I went home that night, I thought to myself, Lord, what was that about? And I had another series of confirmations throughout time, and I, and I realized I think that God wanted me to unpack this and take this to a deeper revelation at this point. Well, let's move on in this prophecy of Elam, Jeremiah 49. <clears throat> and I'm going to read the concluding two verses, uh, verses 38 and 39. And I will set my throne in Elam, <clears throat> and will destroy from thence the king and the princes, saith the Lord. But it shall come to pass in the latter days that I will bring again the captivity of Elam, saith the Lord. The latter days. So that sets the timing of the prophecy. It, has, it does. And so we read the first four verses through 34 through 39 of Jer 37 of Jeremiah 49. Very troubling news with I for Iran. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about a disaster, perhaps nuclear, with a worldwide dispersion humanitarian crisis. But here's the good news now for Iran. <clears throat> and this is why Reza Safa would say they're looking to this prophecy because there's some good news in here. One, it's saying he's gonna, the Lord is going to set his throne up in mm -hmm. Elam. Now, we're going we're to talk about that for a minute in just a moment. And he's going he's gonna to get rid of the kings and the princes. The Islamic repressive leadership is going to be done away with. So that's some good news. And God's going to set his throne up there right now. But he says, in the latter days I will restore the captivity or restore the fortunes of Elam. And what he's talking about there in the very last verse, Gary, is that there will be a, a, a remnant of Iranians of those who are dispersed out into the nations of the world in verse 36 that will come to recognize that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. The theme of a remnant of a, of an, a population or nation coming into the Messianic kingdom because they recognize Jesus Christ mm -hmm. is very relevant in the Bible. There'll yeah. be a faithful remnant of Israelis. There'll be a faithful remnant of Egyptians, Jordanians, Assyrians. And here we find out there'll be a remnant of Iranians as well. And that's exciting news for Iran. It's not all just doom and gloom for them. And he says he's going to set his throne up in Elam. It's the Hebrew word K-I-S-S-E-Kisei. It's the same word used in Isaiah 66. It says, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. And in Jeremiah 3, verses 16 and 17, it says, Jerusalem will be where the throne of the Messiah when he reigns on earth during the Messianic kingdom. That is the most tricky verse right there. What is he saying, I'm going to set my throne up any long. I'm waiting. <laughs> I'm waiting for the answer. <laughs> well, they're going to have to read the book because I write about it inside the book. Uh -huh. right? Okay. Okay. Listen, the book is called Nuclear Showdown in Iran, and we're carrying it here along with the DVD. Uh, you can see right uh, on the screen in front of your eyes how to get to our online bookstore and order this uh, package for yourself, the book, the DVD, Nuclear Showdown in Iran. It's a a current conundrum.
When I think of the Middle East today, Bill, the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, the stalwart Benjamin Netanyahu standing up in the United Nations and telling people, look, this is the way it really is. You have to listen to me. And what he's talking about is the incredible threat posed by Iran. And how many centrifuges do they have over there producing uh, fissile materials for nuclear weapons? I forget the number, but it's... Presently, it's 19,000. 19,000. They've, they've toned it down to where only about half of those are spinning presently as, as their goodwill gesture to negotiate. Do you think you know, they're really keeping their word on that? I, I don't. And they're, they're, they've already got the International Atomic Energy Agency saying they're not being forthright on other things they're concerned about. And so we're dealing with a very grave concern. And you're going to continue to see Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu alerting America and the world to this alarming problem. This is the elephant in the room he's pointing out in the Middle East. ISIS is a problem, and they're starting to burgeon. You're starting to see <coughs> other terrorist organizations, splinter groups like as Jabhat al-Nusra out of Syria. Uh, former al-Qaeda group and uh, Egyptian terrorist group aligning with ISIS. They're a problem, but they are not sovereign over a, their own state per se, and they do not have their finger on a, the pulse of a nuclear weapon and an ICBM. So you need to be careful of what Benjamin Netanyahu is saying about Iran. They are the big issue right now. And the bright side is there's an amazing Christian revival going on in Iran right now. You may not have heard about it, uh, uh, Bill and I are going to spend some time talking about that on, on another broadcast. Uh, an amazing uh, evangelical movement in that part of the country. Last place on earth you would th think you would find uh, a Christian riv revival because the death penalty is attached to it. Who in the world would come to Christ knowing that they might lose their life? This is the the backstory that you're talking about is the bigger story in my estimation. When I started writing this book, I was trying to understand this nuclear potential with this prophecy. But the Lord led me into these, like with Reza Safa, and I've already I've been on TV shows with Hormoz Shariat with Iran Alive Ministries. He also reaches in through satellite television into Iran. Iran is the number one growing evangelical population in the world, growing at 19.6 percent. Compare that to America growing at 0.8 percent. Dreams, visions, healings, and miracles, the story that are coming out of Iran with these millions of former Muslims converting to Christi Christianity is just so exhilarating and exciting because we will see, it when, as you get into the book, and I put into the book this whole spiritual showdown also between mm -hmm. Islam and Christianity, you are going to find out that the Lord is extremely busy continuing to reconcile people in the most repressed areas to his, immaculate, to his heart through Jesus Christ. The book, Nuclear Showdown in Iraq, and you can see right here on the Prophecy Watchers website how to order it along with the DVD. And I hope you've enjoyed listening to author Bill Solace today because he's put a lot of study in uh, into this material. It's very well developed. Bill, we've got to talk again. Thank you, Gary. I will be back. Thank you. I'm Gary Stearman. Keep watching, everybody. very recently, in Jeremiah 49, and I'm going to start in verse 34, Bill, and just kind of bring okay. people up to speed. Sure. Jeremiah writes, uh, it's, it's almost a strange prophecy if you've never encountered it before. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts, behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the chief of their might. And I'll stop right there, and first of all, let's identify Elam, but also, I want to mention the fact that when you see... Hello again, welcome to another edition of Prophecy Watchers. I'm Gary Stearman, and once again, my guest is author and lecturer Bill Solace. Hi, Bill. Hi, Gary. It's good to be back again. Hey, always good to talk to you, Bill. And by the way, you're going to find out why it's good to talk to Bill, because he's got some really interesting information, prophetically speaking. As a matter of fact, we're going to be talking about this book, Nuclear Showdown in Iran, in Iran and by, there's an accompanying DVD, which we'll mention later. Uh, essentially, Bill has taken a prophecy that was kind of a little-known prophecy up until be a prophecy in the Bible that is this uh, overt, discreet, 
then you want to look for it either having been fulfilled at some time in the past or uh, thinking that it might be fulfilled at some time in the future. So I'm sure you've been through all those exercises. Yes, absolutely. And my conclusion is that it has not found historical fulfillment. I do go through the reasons for that inside of the book. Mm -hmm. And at le I've drawn the conclusion that we are looking at a prophecy for our time that is imminent. And as we explore the details of the prophecy, we're going to see that the conditions are ripe right now for this prophecy. Now, a lot of you may have read this prophecy over the years. <coughs> and you may have, uh, have read about Elam. E-L-A-M, I think most people probably in the past pronounced, pronounced it Elam. It, I'm not sure that's it's important, except have you ever wondered who Elam is or Elam? Uh, and, and by the way, who are they? They're sort of mysterious. Right. Now, Elam was the grandson of Noah. He was the son of Shem. And his descendants made their way down and sort of settled in the area of modern-day Iran that hugs the Persian Gulf. Mm -hmm. So it would be on the western side of Iran. Hmm. Now, when we look at a map of modern-day Iran, you'll see Elam comprises about one-fifth of modern-day Iran, and Persia makes, ancient Persia makes up the rest, mm -hmm. so the other four-fifths. Now, Jeremiah writes a prophecy of the latter days in, about Elam. He, you read verse 34, says it was during the early reign of King Zedekiah. King Zedekiah was the last king of Judah. Mm -hmm. And so we would put the timing of this prophecy around 596 B.C. Now, Jeremiah's contemporary Ezekiel, he wrote around 593 to 582 B.C. And he wrote about Persia in that window period of time. And his Ezekiel 